Hey everybody, it's Helen Hillix and I'm hopping on right now to record a podcast for From My Heart to Yours and a YouTube video. And I want to welcome you all. I'm so happy to talk to you today and I'm really excited about the topic, which is the fear of intimacy. And this is something that plagues absolutely every one of us. I don't care if you think you have it or you don't think you have it, you have it. <laughs> and, and maybe some of you have actually done enough work that you, you may have overcome a lot of this, but it is one of the most common things that comes up in couples and, and even just in individuals, you know, who are struggling to figure themselves out and get to a different level of self-awareness. So let's talk about it. Let's just dive in. You know, the fear of intimacy. Why do we fear it? And also, why do we long for it? Because that's one of the things that drives us so crazy about it, isn't it? Is that we are terrified of getting too close to somebody and we are terrified of being alone. And so it causes one of the most common conflicts inside ourselves and within relationships is that, that same conflict. It's like we're scared to death of it and, we, and we're dying to have it. So why can't, we, why can't we seem to make peace with it and just go for it? And there's a common, I think, misconception that men are more afraid of it than women. I, I don't think that's true. I think women are afraid of it also that we just cope with it in different ways that makes it look like we aren't as afraid of it as men. You know, that whole commitment issue, you know, that men don't want to commit and so forth. And, you know, maybe there is some testosterone related and biological imperative relationship to men wanting to have multiple partners and we just throw it away as they're afraid of intimacy. But I think that's a whole other story. And we're not going to get into that today. So I want to quote a friend of mine, Beth Green, whose book, Living with Reality, is a, an incredible encyclopedia of human behavior. And if you haven't read it yet, you can get it as a free download on her website at bethgreen.org. And this is what she says in that book. And I'm quoting her, raging and fearful. We experience ourselves as real. Aligned and harmonious, we fear we will lose ourselves. I want to say that again. Raging and fearful, we experience ourselves as real. Aligned and harmonious, we fear we will lose ourselves. So I want to give you an example of that. You know, my husband and I are close and love each other so much. And then I notice that I'm picking him apart. And and I don't know why, you know, just like all of a sudden I get in this mood where, you know, he can't do anything right. And I just think, oh, why am I with him? And then there are other times when, and then, and then it just passes. It's like, then I wake up one morning and I think, what was I thinking? You know, I love this man. And the same thing on his side, you know, he'll wake up and be in this mood where he's angry and blaming and irritable and just hard to be around. And, and you know, when, when I'm noticing that, I'm able to say something's just coming up for him. And then it just, you know, shifts. And, you know, one of the ways it shifts, of course, I'm not going to pretend like it's just magic. One of the ways it shifts is that we get support. We talk about it. We notice what's going on. And, you know, if you have been listening to me for a while, you know that, you know, the first step is always to set your intention. Set your intention that you want to clear whatever's blocking you and then come back together. So we'll talk more about that later, but I just want to give you some examples of how insidious it is and how it just creeps in. This fear of intimacy just creeps in. And of course, I'm not saying that there's nothing ever really going on that needs to be cleared up. It isn't always just the fear of intimacy, but sometimes it is. So the, the reality, guys, is going back to raging and fearful, we experience ourselves as real, aligned and harmonious, we fear we will lose ourselves. You know, we come from the oneness, right? We are all made out of chi. The chi is the, the building block of every single thing that exists. 
And so we have this connection to the oneness and that's where we come from. And yet we live inside of a skin, don't we? We live inside of a skin and we're individuals. And from that individual existence comes the core of this whole thing and that is the ego. The ego is the awareness that I am an individual, that I am not you. And the problem isn't that we have an ego because we all need an ego. If we're going to live inside an individual skin, we better be aware that we are not that piece of grass growing next to us. We are an individual that whose teeth need to be flossed and who shouldn't be running out in traffic because we wouldn't be an individual for very long <laughs> if we didn't realize that we're an individual, we need to be fed, et cetera. We need to take care of ourselves. So the ego is not the problem. And you know, I, I think that is a really, really important thing to stress because people tell you all the time, kill the ego, get rid of the ego. But that's not real. That's not even possible because the ego is the awareness of our individual being. So there isn't anything wrong with the ego. The problem is that we don't develop other parts of ourselves. We don't develop the spiritual wisdom and the emotional intelligence that we need to be able to deal with things in a more mature way than the ego does. And so the ego ends up dominating everything we do. And that is the raging and fearful we experience ourselves as real part. We are continuously trying to prove I'm different than you. I'm an individual. I'm better than you. Or sometimes even I'm worse than you. The ego doesn't even care as long as it separates you. That's the whole purpose of it is to remind you that you're an individual. So it just keeps pushing away, pushing away, pushing away and comes up with it. And that's what I was referring to before with my husband and myself comes up with these really ridiculous ways of separating us from each other, including just picking each other apart. That is so, so common and so sad. And I'm not over it yet. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I'm not over it yet, although I work on it all the time. So it's the domination of the ego that really is the, the core of why we're afraid of intimacy, because the ego tells us to be. It tells us that if you aren't careful, you're going to lose yourself. And of course, let's take this a little bit further. Uh, and that is that our original experience of the oneness is our families. That, that is our first experience on a, on a conscious level you know, co cosmically or however you want to think of that, you know, we, we might be aware that we're still part of the oneness, but on a conscious level, our first experience of oneness that we remember is of our families. And let's be real, guys. How did our families handle the pain around us? Because that's one of the things that the ego can latch on to and feels very, very real is I don't want to connect to you because you're in pain. I don't want to connect to other people because they're in pain. I don't even want to connect to the whole world because it's in so much pain. And so we, we withdraw when we get to a certain place where we can really feel each other's pain. We don't know what to do about it. And we don't know what to do about it because our families didn't know what to do about it. And I'm not blaming our parents, you know, that, that traditional thing of, you know, it's all your parents' fault. I'm not saying that. They didn't know any better either, did they? Because their parents didn't know. Nobody taught us how to deal with pain. You know, they taught us, oh, you don't feel right? Go out with your friends. Go get drunk. Smoke a joint. You don't feel good? Blame your wife. Blame your husband. Beat your kids. You know, go, go running for 85 miles and come home and you'll feel better, but you won't really have changed. So it's like, we did not learn how. We did not learn how to deal with pain. We didn't not learn how to go toward the pain. We didn't learn how to be loving in our treatment of pain. 
we learned how to tell each other how to behave, you know, and that's another aspect of this was when we're children, you know, you're supposed to be seen and not heard. You're supposed to do what your parents and your teachers want. You're, you're not supposed to be yourself necessarily. You're supposed to fit in. And perhaps this is less so nowadays, but you know, certainly when I grew up, that was the mandate. And I still think it's there. There's a lot of pressure to be the way other people are. And of course, if you don't feel that that fits you, let's say you're raised Catholic and you feel at a very young age, it doesn't fit you, but you are sent to Catholic school. You are sent to Catholic church. You are made to go through catechism and whatever it is, and you feel like that does not fit you, then it's like you, you get to be afraid of intimacy because you're being forced to be something that doesn't feel in alignment with who you are. And that is a great fear that we have of losing ourselves. In relationships, you know, it starts very, very young. And maybe you had a dominating father and you saw him dominate your mother. You know, that was the case for my husband's family was, you know, the father was the typical Italian Catholic man and, you know, and his little woman at home never didn't learn how to drive till she was 50 or something like that. You know, and it's like he was the dominator of the family. And, you know, of course, the sad thing is that leaves him alone and it leaves her alone. But both of them are afraid of intimacy, of really letting go of those old roles that were taught to them because they had to take on the roles to fit into society. But then they, at some point, those roles are not satisfying anymore because there's no intimacy. So it's like we long for it and we're afraid of it at the same time. People say, I don't want to have the hassle of uh, being in a relationship. I mean, I've heard this so many times by people very close to me too. You know, I'm happy that I don't have a husband, you know, which I can relate to. You know, life is very much simpler when you don't have a husband or a wife. And yet the first opportunity when somebody really shows an interest in that person and really acts like they want to be with them, it's like that whole, whole statement of I don't want to be with anybody just goes right out the door because we really do long for it in our hearts, don't we? We just long for it. So I wanna give another example of a couple that I'm working with where he wanted to have sex all the time and she thought she didn't. And you know, she thought he was just using her for, you know, like a porn star and he thought she didn't love him. And so it's like this, both of them have this fear of, of getting to what's really going on. But once they came to me and got clear about the fact that it really was trauma from their childhoods that was making him feel like he wanted to have sex all the time as a reassurance and making her feel like, you know, she shouldn't want to have sex because it was, it was nasty. And so once they cleared those things up, they are so much happier and so much more intimate. So it's the ego tells us it's dangerous, but our souls tell us it's the only way that we're going to be happy. And of course, we learn the dysfunctional way of, ha of dealing with it from looking around us, not just from our original families, but from the world. Like, how does the world handle the pain of the whole? Do we come together and say, oh, there are all these people who are hungry Let's get rid of our nationalism and come together and handle the pain of the world together. We have plenty of resources, but no. And what is nationalism? You know, nationalism is ego. It's like the United States is separate from the rest of the world and China is separate from the rest of the world. But the reality is we're all one world. We can't get away from it. If, you know, the Japanese nuclear plant, you know, melts down, it, it contaminates the world, not just Japan. So it's like we get to learn how to handle the pain of the whole, but we're not doing a very good job of it yet. And so that trickles down to every individual. And the truth is our fear of intimacy comes down to one thing, is that we don't trust ourselves to handle it. We don't know how 
to handle intimacy. Because let's face it, again, as I said, very few of us are really happy alone. We get lonely, we get miserable, we feel worthless and unfulfilled. And so, you know, most all of us, without exception, we, we long to be connected, we long to be intimate, we long to feel that experience of oneness in sacred sexuality. And I've been talking a lot about that lately, about sacred sexuality. And this is one of the blocks to it, is the fear of intimacy, the fear that we're gonna lose ourselves. And you know, I wanna segue into, there's been a lot of, of, of resurgence in the interest of psychedelics recently. And why is that? Why is there such an interest in psychedelics? And it's not just recreational that I'm talking about. I'm talking about scientific interest in it. And the two things that come to my mind immediately are the interest in using psychedelics to treat depression and the use of psychedelics to treat the fear, the horrible, debilitating fear that cancer patients feel as they are looking forward, you know, looking forward to the future and, and being afraid of dying. And why is it that, that those two areas in particular are turning to psychedelics for treatment? Well, it's because the, the use of psychedelics gives you a glimpse of what it's like to be in the oneness. It gets rid of the boundaries of the ego. And it really gives you an experience of what it's like to be in the oneness. And I'm not, I'm not by any means recommending that everybody run out and do psychedelics. That's not the point of this. The point of this is the, the realization that the medical community is finally understanding the spiritual principle of oneness and how healing it is. Because you know what, guys, we are all looking for relaxation and safety. And again, that is, it's kind of an interesting collapse of oneness and the ego. You know, the ego is so tired of fighting, you know, it just makes me want to cry. The ego is so tired of fighting, but it doesn't know how to do anything else. Because raging and fearful, it experiences itself as real. And aligned and harmonious, we're afraid we're going to lose ourselves. But our desire for safety and relaxation is only met when we lose the domination of the ego and we can relax into the oneness. That's why, again, there is such a resurgence and a growth in the areas of yoga and meditation and mindfulness is because when we're in those states of meditative bliss, we are in the oneness. We're not worried about brushing our teeth or making money or fighting with our partners. We are just connected to the oneness. So we are longing for that experience of relaxation and safety that comes from getting out of the ego. And that's why the psychedelics are being used is because it's a very powerful, rapid way of saying, hey, wake up wake the hell up. You are not just your ego. There is a whole magical, mysterious experience of oneness beyond what the ego is telling you. And if we can remember that and find that experience of oneness through other methods, you know, then you don't have to turn to psychedelics. You know, you can use meditation, for instance, but you have to bring it back in. That's one of the other things that you know people would go on acid trips or whatever and go into the psychedelics but they didn't know how to integrate that back into their lives and that's where help can come in handy we can't do this by ourselves usually but even meditation i've had many clients who meditated but they could never bring back that feeling of oneness into the actual behavioral changes that they need to make in order to overcome that fear of intimacy so that's what it's really all about, is reminding ourselves, having experiences, and sacred sexuality is the same thing. It's having an experience of losing yourself in the oneness and seeing how glorious it can be, because you're not really losing yourself in the oneness. You are connecting to the oneness and yourself at the same time. 
And that is the answer to the fear of intimacy, is the be, being able to learn how to live, as Beth Green says, as an individual in the context of oneness. And that may sound like gibberish to some of you, but let me see if I can explain what I mean. Let me see if I can give you an example. I mean, having sacred sexuality is an example. It's like you're not really losing yourself. You are an individual with another individual or sometimes with yourself and the universe. You haven't gone anywhere. You haven't lost yourself. But the experience of oneness is so powerful that you aren't focused only on yourself. You are also aware of the oneness and aware of your partner and you being joined to the oneness all together at once. Another example is a very different kind of example, but you are angry at your partner, but you take a breath, which is an instant reminder of the oneness, by the way. You take a breath and you connect to the oneness by taking that breath and it gives you a complete shift in consciousness and awareness. And you bring that energy of oneness in to help shift the ego, which says that we need to separate because we're fighting. And it just shifts. And you change your intention from proving that you're right to resolving whatever is separating you. And that is bringing the oneness into your day-to-day behaviors and that ability to do that breaks down our fear of intimacy because that's what is really all about is that we're afraid we don't know how to handle the oneness and so we we want to stay away from it consciously or unconsciously we keep pushing away from it because we don't trust ourselves to have the skills to be able to be ourselves to express ourselves and to also connect to another person and to work out our perceived differences so that we can stay intimate we can stay in that feeling of the oneness so guys this is the challenge is for you to get the support you need whatever that is in order to learn the skills so that you can stay yourself and still navigate the sometimes turbulent waters of relationships and the oneness. And I'm talking about whether it's me and my relationship to the world, in which case there's a lot of uh, tumultuous water going on, but I take the action that I feel intuitively guided to take. And when you take action, guys, that's when your fear diminishes. I don't need to separate from the world if I'm taking action to do what I can to help the world. And I don't have to be afraid of losing myself in my relationship as long as I take the action to learn the skills that I need to be able to manage things in a way that I get to feel good about. I'm not going to go out and get drunk or have sex with somebody else or be, you know, as much as I can not be angry and mean to my partner. I'm going to take a breath and remind myself who I am and that I come from the oneness and that I long for intimacy. <sighs> and then I can use the, the, the many skills that I've learned over my lifetime to be able to understand what he's going through or what she's going through, what they're going through, so that we can reconnect and live in a state of intimacy. And intimacy doesn't mean that I'm going to feel blissful every moment, but it means that I trust myself to be able to navigate those tumultuous waters and to be able to stay connected ultimately. So guys, practice, get the support you need, enjoy your lives, enjoy your connections, realize that your ego gets triggered right and left all the time, and that's okay, but we don't have to be dominated by it. And if you have any questions or comments, you are so welcome to talk to me anytime. I love you all, and I will talk to you next week.